If you know the name John Fredericks, he was the John in John Fredericks. So he partnered with him until 1948, until he established his own millinery salon. And in the 40s and 50s, his name was as famous as Christian Dior. So if you're a collector and you have Mr. John hats, consider yourself um, very lucky. Uh, although they're still out there, there's lots around. And um, they're very high fashion and definitely collectible. I want to say a word, word though, about the um, the practice by Milner's in the 1960s, late 1950s, actually. We think of it more in the 60s, but it started happening in the 1950s when designers were realizing that uh, a lot of the time women had decided not to wear hats. Ponytails, bobby soxers, uh, they certainly were setting a different trend. And to market to that demographic, millinery designers decided that they needed to do something special. And so many of the great designers came out with a junior line uh, marketed specifically to teens. And I want to show you a couple of those. So if you're looking uh, for Mr. John's hats, you'll find them under the label Mr. John, Mr. John Jr., and John Fredericks when he partnered with Frederick Hurst prior to 1948 when uh, Mr. John opened his own salon. Now, uh, John is actually his first name and his last name. He was John P. John. So I want to show you one of the Mr. John Jr. hats. This is the label. So when they began uh, marketing to a younger demographic they really went with this bold graphics uh, in their labels and you'll find these you'll find a junior uh, Lily Dachet line called Dachettes you will find a junior Mr. Charles uh, line and I'll do videos on those uh, at another time so this is a real tip off although you would probably think that this hat style would be a little more matronly than something that would be um, marketed to young teens. But of course, teens in the 50s were emulating their mothers. They were joining sororities. They were um, being, you know, particularly the debutantes would have a lot of occasions to wear a hat, something like this. But it is almost a variation on a pillbox. The rounded crown, of course, uh, is not um, pillbox style, but you can see this wonderful, um, I'll show you the workmanship here, starting again from the center crown, how this type of straw would come on a spool, and then it is hand sewn beautifully in concentric circles to create the shape, and then used as a trim along the velvet band. Of course, the label is always at the center back, and if you don't find a label in your hat, Always look for the center seam. That will give you a clue. I should tell you that um, when I was doing, well, of course, we've been doing them for years, uh, two decades actually, prior to the onset of COVID, we were presenting um, many, many, many retrospective millinery fashion shows. And at one such event, a woman told me that she had gone, I think it was in the 60s, to her Milner, as women did in the spring, to have a new spring hat made. And of course, you wouldn't enter the salon without wearing a hat. So she plucked the hat she'd been wearing the previous spring, popped it on her head and went to the Milner's. And of course, back then you sat in front of um, the Milner's um, full length mirror. Milner would stand behind you, remove your hat, offer you suggestions of uh, what she might have for you for the coming season. And when the Milner removed this hat, she said to her client, Oh, have you always worn the hat this way? Maybe she thought, you know, the lady rushed out the door that morning and just threw it on incorrectly. But, um, you know, the owner of the hat said, oh, yes, I wore this all last spring this way. Why? And the milliner said, well, you've actually been wearing it backwards. This was designed to be worn um, the opposite way. And it looked very, very different once the milliner turned it around and showed her how the hat should have properly been worn but she lost a sale because the shopper said oh well i'll just start wearing it like this and uh, no one will know that this isn't a new hat and um, so the milliner lost a sale so but that's a lesson too although hats were designed 
to be worn a particular way, especially if it's a custom hat. When we're finding vintage hats today, obviously we're not finding vintage um, custom hats made for ourselves. So try them on different ways. You might find that uh, there's a silhouette that you like better than the way it was meant um, to be worn. So that's a little aside. Uh, another little aside is one of my viewers <laughs> said to me that she doesn't like seeing those big, loose um, millen uh, museum gloves that I wear to handle the hats. And she asked me, did I not have vintage gloves that I could wear? And of course, I have a large collection. And so no problem. Uh, this is what I will wear today. Now, I'll show you another Mr. John Jr. hat. And I may have shown this before on another video on another topic, but it is worth showing again. These are wonderful, wonderful um, colors. They're so bright. This is a flocked velvet done on a satin. And this is a typical palette of fashion in the 1970s. So a wonderful attempt to continue uh, the wearing of hats amongst young women. Um, futile, of course, into the 70s. We know that hats fell very far out of fashion. So far, in fact, that I will tell you that when I began collecting and talking to directors of uh, the directors and curators of established museums, they told me that museums, hats had fallen so far out of fashion in the 70s that museums uh, stopped collecting them. Many, many of our donors told me that they had beautiful um, vintage hats in perfect condition that they wished to donate to museums at the time, and they were told that the museums did not want them. So it's kind of interesting that from a fashion history perspective, that many of these museums were showing fashion uh, without the hats that they were originally designed to be worn with. So um, rather incorrectly, in my opinion. I do know that, <laughs> I obviously know with over 3,500 hats cataloged in our museum, what a chore it is. I wouldn't say chore, it's a pleasure, but what a challenge it is to store hats. And um, some are stored in original boxes, some are stored, very precious ones, um, are stored in archival storage boxes. Of course, that's ideal. It's not always affordable. Um, and there are some interesting museums that I have visited who have some very uh, intriguing ways of storing their hats. There is the Dugald Museum in Western Canada that has what they call visible storage, and that's really exciting. I visited there some years ago, and I have no reason to believe, although I could be incorrect, that they are continuing to um, store them in that unique fashion. So that's something you could look into. Um, so getting back to this hat, bit of a um, what we might think of as a floppy hat today, medium-sized brim. It has this it has this casual ruffle effect that was more exaggerated in the 1970s floppy hat style. And, uh, but it's very beautifully made. It is lined, it's high quality. Mr. John Jr. again, the label. So there are two examples of the Jr. line. And as I say, I will be doing others uh, by famous American designers at another date. Now, while we're talking about Mr. John Jr. and Mr. John in general, I want to show you a piece of fashion from his line that is not a hat, and it's quite exciting to me. This is a fabric belt. You can see the paisley, the bright colors, the metal ornamentation. And I will show you his label. And this was carried in iMagnon. This actually snaps shut and gives you not a lot of flexibility in how it's going to fit. So, and it's very small. I should have measured it for you. But I can tell you, it is too small for me. But it, it's a wonderful 
um, wonderful vintage piece that I think uh, is terribly wearable today and a great example of the Mr. John line. I'll also tell you that I got so excited about uh, looking at some of these vintage belts. We, As I say uh, many times, we do ha have more than hats in the Millinery Museum. That was our jumping off point. It's still our focus. But along the way, we have accessioned a great number of vintage costume and other accessories, often uh, as they are donated to us in a complete ensemble, which is so interesting from a fashion perspective of exactly how women purchased and wore and put together different different outfits uh, from the past. So in um, studying some of the belt buckles and belts that we have and being inspired by the unveiling of the Di recent Diana statue with that very prominent 1980s belt buckle, I have uh, written an article on the subject which I will share with you once it is released in November. It will be in the November, December issue of the um, Upper Canadian Antiques and um, Vintage Magazine. So I leave you with that. Of course, as always, I will tell you about the hat I'm wearing. I think this is just a beautiful little piece from the 1930s. It really sort of sets the tone. It's very in keeping with the silhouette of that time. It is a brown beaver felt with a braided self-fabric bow at the center back. And then this is a brown velvet trimming the wired rim. And it almost has a hint, just a hint of sort of a pinky red tone. This one has no, um, no maker's mark. It's one of those anonymous pieces that I love so much from the late 1930s. So I thank you for watching. Please leave me comments or questions if you have any. I will um, continue to post Mondays and Thursdays if you want to be notified and not have to remember the name of my channel or my name. Uh, you can always hit subscribe, hit the notification bell and you will just be notified automatically in your feed of when I do uh, produce new content. In the meantime, I have linked to a couple of videos from the 1930s as that is uh, the era of the hat I'm wearing today. And I wish you all a happy day.